Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. For more than two decades, he's been host of HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, where he's not afraid to court controversy or debate political minds on both sides of the aisle. In his latest book, What This Comedian Said Will Shock You, he updates the editorials he delivers at the end of each episode for the current political climate. Marr sat down for a chat with our chief election and campaign correspondent, Robert Costa. I speak for the normies, you know. I, I speak for that, I think, vast middle that is tired of the partisanship. Um, I don't want to hate half the country, and I don't hate half the country. You write a lot of, throughout this book that the left irritates you, frustrates you at times, but the right often alarms you. Yes. <laughs> They're very alarming. They're extremely alarming. <clears throat> more alarming. What do you say to your critics, though, who say, then you should just focus on them, Bill. If they're more alarming to you than the left, then why not shine the spotlight on them only? The truth isn't one-sided like that. Later in the show, among other things, Bill Maher shares his thoughts on the benefits, or lack thereof, of a college education. You say in the book, people shouldn't go to college these days. I was way ahead on that one. Democrats have this idea that college solves everything. That if we could just get everybody to be more sitting in a classroom looking at a blackboard and taking notes, things would just be better in this country. And it's not true. It wasn't true, and it's ever less true the more crazy colleges become. Instead of trying to get everybody to go into college, which is just a big scam with the loans and the money, uh, just make college less necessary, which it is for almost every job. Then a fresh take on fresh flowers. Connor Knighton introduces us to artists creating and selling bright, delicate blooms from paper. This one is probably my most difficult flower to make. This is a double peony. How much trial and error is involved in this? So much trial and error. I think that's the fun part of this. As a being a creative, as an artist, you're like, what can I do with this flat piece of paper and make something really amazing with it? That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Bill Maher says he aims to keep it real on his long-running HBO show, and he's okay if that offends people in the process. Chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa spoke with Maher about booking his sometimes controversial guests. Can you make an audience laugh and think at the same time? Totally, of course. I don't understand this. No cameras at the Supreme Court. I don't get this. You can film everything in America. You can barely go to the washroom on a plane without it being filmed. <laughs> The great thing about laughter is that it's involuntary. So if you laugh at something, something in you tells you that's true. It must be true. I laughed at it. Maybe I wasn't supposed to. A study of eight developed countries found that U.S. students were dead last in math skills, but number one in confidence in math skills. <laughs> Even though they suck at it. Yes, we're number one in thinking we're number one. If you catch yourself laughing at something Bill Maher has said lately on HBO's Real Time, his Friday night perch for the past 21 years, just be careful. Next time, the joke could be on you. How long have you been, you've been doing this for so long? This interview? It, well, does it, seem, it does seem like it. Nobody is spared Bill Maher's humor. Political TV is full of groans and eye rolls. And or as he sees it, his truth-telling, not on the right. If you're going to turn over your party to a foreign power, at least pick the right one. Russia? Are you kidding? It's like the Republicans looked over all the companies they could merge with and pick Sears. <laughs> Nor on the left. You call yourself the resistance? Then fight behind enemy lines. That's what a resistance does. That's the difference between blowing up a tank and tweeting about it. Get out of your echo chamber and infiltrate theirs. What is the through line through everything you write and everything you say? Uh, keep it real, you know? Don't be tribal. Don't say something just because that's going to make the audience of one side applaud or boo practical solutions as opposed to ideological and uh, don't pull a punch. We have a great show. It's the 68-year-old Marr has been swinging at targets high and low his entire career. 
taking his own share of knocks along the way, but he still gladly courts controversy. The right response to speech you don't like is more speech, not the lazy, cowardly response of canceling people. That attitude explains the title of his book. It's compiled from years of Mars commentary on real time. I wanted to see if the world had changed or I had changed more. I was excavating, reading over all these editorials from years and years and years, and I wanted to find that answer. I speak for the normies, you know. I, I speak for that, I think, vast middle that is tired of the partisanship. Um, I don't want to hate half the country, and I don't hate half the country. You write a lot of, throughout this book that the left irritates you, frustrates you at times, but the right often alarms you. Yes. <laughs> They're very alarming. They're extremely alarming, <clears throat> more alarming. What do you say to your critics, though, who say, then you should just focus on them, Bill. If they're more alarming to you than the left, then why not shine the spotlight on them only? The truth isn't one-sided like that. The Democrats constantly are uh, running against Trump with the idea, you people out there couldn't possibly vote for this guy. And, and people are saying, watch me, hold my beer. Watch me vote for him again. Instead of just saying, oh, he's lied. We know he's a liar. He's Donald Trump. He can't help himself. He's crazy. I mean, I think literally crazy. I think there's a, a kind of a level of malignant narcissism, which is not just a personality quirk. It's diagnosable, and he suffers from it. Trump has made over 8,000 false or misleading statements as president. Nothing like this has ever happened before. If you had him on real time, what would you ask him? <laughs> would you please go away? Have you asked him to come on? Of course. We've asked everybody. I mean, of that stature. Um, he knows he has an open invitation to come on. But I don't think he really hates me because I think he... this. I, I, the, the amount of times that he goes after me. He watches the show. Accidentally. It's always accidentally. <laughs> he watches it accidentally every week. It's amazing. In fact, conservatives don't shy away from real time. He is the former attorney general. Wow, under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Donald Trump, Bill Barr is on here. When Bill Barr came on your show, what did some of your Democratic friends say? Yeah, this is exactly what I hate about this country. How dare you? How dare you platform someone? The way I see it, we, we are moving, becoming a much more secular society, just 55 but years. But that's by free will. That's good. I mean, I, no, it's good, good that people, people do have free will. Oh, good. Okay? And, and they, should, <laughs> they should be able... They should be able... <laughs> yeah. So you're going to have to talk to people, and maybe you'll find out that they're not the monsters you think they are. I mean, do I apologize for Bill Barr's, uh, I thought, horrible behavior when the, when the Mueller report came out and he basically uh, lied about it? I don't. But look, this is what I call a good-as-it-gets Republican. He came out and said Trump lost the election. That's the main thing in the Republican Party right now. Do you believe elections count only if you win? As good as it gets could well be Mars motto for politics. I certainly have my quarrels with the left. And for life. To me, these are probably the good old days. It could get a lot worse. Not wishing for what could be, but recognizing are, what he sees is real and taking you on if you're not. You say you're cynical about politics? Don't flatter yourself. Cynical comes when you know too much. You, on the other hand, haven't bothered to learn anything. <laughs> Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Robert Costa's chat with Bill Maher, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. It's a, one of, again one of those things you have to examine, look hard at yourself. As promised, here's more from Robert Costa's interview with Bill Maher. You're not just a comedian. I mean, no. the culture kind of looks to people on TV, to comics, for political guidance. It's almost how the whole country seems to function now. I feel like most of the other ones, they're playing to just a amen choir that's already there. 
they're saying something to make the people go, yes, absolutely. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying things that very often upset people or just at least make them think. Just consider the other side. Consider this. Um, sometimes these editorials start out one way and some of the people will be like, yeah. that's." And then halfway through, it's like, oh, wait, what's he saying now? Yeah, because I'm, I'm presenting the other side. It's one thing I hate about the media these days is I never feel like I get the full story from anybody. You're always just presenting the things that you want me to hear to make you be on your side in this issue. It's always about the narrative, never about the truth. I have to read things from all over the spectrum to get the full story. Well, I'm trying to buck that trend. Biden allies, they keep saying this election's about democracy. You buy that argument? Yes. Well, who was the one who kept saying Trump is never going to leave and everyone was laughing at? That would be me for years. Um, so many Republicans, I could play the tapes, who were on the show, and I would present that with them, and they'd, oh, Bill, you smoke too much pot. And, no, apparently I smoked just the right amount of pot, because I had that right. So um, just because it didn't happen in 2020 uh, doesn't mean it won't happen in 2024. I mean, very often there's a dress rehearsal for something horrific, and Trump learned from 2020. He thought he could rely on certain Republicans just because they were Republicans. That's the phone call to Georgia. Can you find me 11,000 votes? And what we found out is that there are a lot of Republicans who are patriots, and they're not Trumpers. I mean, there's too many who are and who don't understand what democracy is anymore uh, and will back Trump no matter what he says or does, and that's a cult. But there's also ones like that Raffsenberger guy in Georgia who did the right thing and said, look, I voted for you, Mr. President. I wanted you to win, but we can count here in Georgia. We did it. You lost. Be a man. Get over it. You say in the book people shouldn't go to college these days. I was way ahead on that one. Democrats have this idea that college solves everything that if we could just get everybody to be more sitting in a classroom looking at a blackboard and taking notes, things would just be better in this country. And it's not true. It wasn't true, and it's ever less true the more crazy colleges become. Instead of trying to get everybody to go into college, which is just a big scam with the loans and the money, uh, just make college less necessary, which it is for almost every job. It's just not that necessary. Do you have to go to medical school? Yes, of course, law school. But for most things, it's just a, it's a scam. It's a ticket to the middle class. If you look at the statistics, the people who have a college degree, they just make a lot more money. What do you make of the generational divide in this country? A lot of older people might hear what you say, not along. Younger people go, you just don't get it. <laughs> well, some of, the, some of the younger Democrats. Yeah, I mean... That to me, and that's one of the funniest chapters that I enjoyed putting together the most was the one on generations. Generations is just a funny subject. It always has been for comedians. I mean, of course, everybody gets older and they think the young people are crazy. It's a, one of, again one of those things you have to examine, look hard at yourself. Do I look at this thing and not like it because I'm older and it's just newer, or is it actually stupid? Sometimes new is better, and sometimes new is just new for the sake of being new. Up next, it's Paper in Bloom. Welcome back. The concept of paper flowers isn't new, but social media has brought more attention and artistry to the creation of blossoms that appear just as fresh as the real deal. Here's Connor Knighton. <laughs> For the past few weeks, this team of florists in Holt, Michigan has been prepping, selecting stems, launching bouquets, boxing orders, and yet everyone seems surprisingly relaxed. I think that's the best part about being a paper florist. You can plan for your big holidays way ahead of time. Hey, Lisa. Hey. That's right. All these flowers are artificial. These are so pretty. I love them. I know. Liz Carter is the founder of Unwilted, a company that sells paper arrangements with flowers designed by Carter and crafted overseas. She previously worked as a traditional florist. I had definitely thought I was done with flowers, fresh flowers. I was exhausted. 
And I was looking on social media and I stumbled across crepe paper flowers and just fell in love and I tumbled down the rabbit hole. There's nothing new about paper flowers. Some of the earliest surviving examples are from 7th century China. In the early 20th century, making flowers was a family affair. Impoverished residents of New York City tenements would enlist their children to help assemble them. There are folded Japanese origami lotus flowers and fluffy Mexican festive bouquets. But social media has led to a sort of super bloom of renewed interest, with people showing off their creations and teaching others how to follow in their footsteps. But you're just going to pull one side. These amateur paper pushers are attempting some of Quinn Wynn's floral designs. Start where the gap is and then just build it across. And look how pretty that is. So pretty. I didn't realize I was an artist until I started doing paper flowers, and it just fell into this really beautiful world of meeting other people that love making paper flowers. And it's just opened my eye to like, oh, you can actually do this as a living. Known online as Pink and Posy, Nguyen has managed to craft a career out of paper by taking on everything from corporate commissions Hello, hello. Welcome back to, to co-hosting more than 150 episodes of a Paper Talk podcast. This one is probably my most difficult flower to make. This is a double peony. How much trial and error is involved in this? So much trial and error. I think that's the fun part of this. As a being a creative, as an artist, you're like, what can I do with this flat piece of paper and make something really amazing with it? While flowers can be made with everything from tissue paper to cardstock, pliable European so crepe paper tends to give the most realistic results. This is the Italian one. This is the 90 gram. Oh, wow. And keep stretching it and keep stretching oh, it. that's kind of a magic <laughs> trick. Yeah, huh. Working at home in Kirkland, Washington, Gwen takes pains to make her flowers as realistic as possible. You want to rub it into the paper. Hand painting details, obsessing paint. over every petal. Until I touched this, I had no idea that one of these is real and one of these is fake. And honestly, looking at here, I've kind of forgotten which is which. I'm so happy to hear that. That's the best compliment anyone can give me. Artist Ann Wood, known on Instagram as Woodlucker, models her hyper-realistic flowers after the ones in her garden. The ones in her hand are made of paper. Paper also offers an opportunity to create fanciful, larger-than-life blooms. Artist Tiffany Turner's giant art pieces show in high-end galleries and sell for tens of thousands of dollars. And yet, there can still be a stigma that paper is cheap or tacky. I was talking to my mom when I first did paper flowers in Vietnam, and she was like, oh, that was the poor people way of bringing flowers to the wedding because they couldn't afford fresh flowers. Today, paper flowers can often be more expensive than the genuine article. Good. Which makes sense when you consider all the time involved in making one. The process is the point. I love the quiet moment of joy when I create something. Of course, there's no smell. There's, you can tell the difference. Although, for people with pollen allergies, that could be a plus. Oh, for bees, it is very confusing. But the biggest selling point for faux flowers is the longevity. As Liz Carter points out, paper persists long after the holiday has passed. Coming from the world of fresh flowers, I was always so disappointed when the flowers would die or will. It's such a shame to let such beautiful things be so fleeting. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.